If you will, turn in your Bibles to the 39th chapter of the book of Jeremiah as we continue our study through the Word. Now you'll remember that Jeremiah had been imprisoned. The princes uh, declaring that Jeremiah's words as he was telling them that the Babylonians are going to be used as a judgment of God against them for their idolatry and their disobedience. And, and rather than heeding the words, and Jeremiah again was declaring to them that if you will repent, if you will turn from your ways, then God will relent uh, and he will not bring this judgment. But they would not relent. Instead, they sought to silence Jeremiah's voice. And you'll remember that uh, he was uh, in the prison and, and they said that the princes came to the king and told him he shouldn't even be allowed to live. He is discouraging the people. He is bringing them down, the, the morale and, and all. And so we, we want authority over him. And, and the king said, who am I to oppose the, the princes? And he gives them over to the, uh, to the princes. The princes take and, and throw him down into the, the bottom of a well, into the muck and the mire there. And you remember it was the Ethiopian eunuch that comes back to the king and tells them what they have done now to Jeremiah and he says that if you leave him in there, then he will most certainly die. And so the king commanded 30 soldiers to be given over to the Ethiopian eunuch to go and to rescue him and to pull him up out of the, the miry pit. He, he, he stays now within the prison confines, but now is no longer deep within the pit. You remember that Zedekiah, the king, he comes to... He comes to Jeremiah secretly and, and he talks to Jeremiah about the things that are going to unfold. And, and he says to Jeremiah, certainly, Jeremiah, tell me the truth. What is the word of the Lord in this matter? And, and Jeremiah says, if I tell you the truth, will you kill me? <laughs> will, you, will, will you spare my life if I tell you the truth? And he says that you tell me what the Lord says and I will absolutely not lay my hand against you. And he says, King, you have to surrender to the Babylonians. It is the will of God. You will save the city. You will save the lives of your people. And you will save your own lives. And, and he says, I fear the princes. If I surrender the city, if I open up the cities and I invite the Babylonians uh, in, then I am afraid that, that my own princes will end up mm, killing me. Jeremiah says to some king, hear this, if you do not open up the gates, the Babylonians are going to destroy and burn this entire city, will kill your family, your concubines, will destroy everything that is in front of you. And, and Zedekiah departs. He, he's like, don't tell anybody that I came and talked to you. And, and he departs to, to weigh these matters. He's, he's caught between trusting the, the will of God and being afraid of what men can do to him and what will be the, the consequences if, if he does follow the, the will of God. And, and I find that to be oftentimes a place that, that we can relate to where, where it is difficult to follow the, the will of God when, when everybody else is following a different path and, and it puts you into a direct uh, confrontation, sometimes with family members or friends or co-workers, people that you love. Suddenly now your faith, which in the past was less divisive than it is today, but as we just try and live out our faith, we are seeing that, that it is coming into more and more conflict with the, with the culture that is around us and the direction that that culture is in. And it puts us into that place of, of the fear of the culture, the fear of God. And, and I love what Joshua said, choose you this day who you're going to serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And so we, we see Joshua. Zedekiah, he, he is interested in polling the opinions of, of everybody. And, and God's opinion, unfortunately, becomes just another one of the opinions in his life instead of the only 
opinion that matters. And we're going to see the very thing that he was uh, afraid of is the very thing that by not following the Lord it, it is going to fall upon his own head. Trusting in the Lord with all of your heart, following after the, the will of God is always our best course of action. Amen? And then even when by sight it doesn't look like it. When by sight it looks contrary to. He finds himself in, in a pit, Jeremiah does. And yet God rescues him out of that pit, pulls him out, puts his feet and securely on. He is for him, he is with him. You'll remember in the beginning of his ministry when he was a young man and, and how it was the Lord said that you're gonna declare things and the princes and the kings and the people will be against you, but I will make you a fortified city, an iron pillar and a bronze wall even against the whole land. If God be for us, who can stand against us? And, and so that, that example of Jeremiah now, following the, the will of God regardless of circumstances, and, and what is he doing? He's encouraging and exhorting everybody else to follow the will of God from, from the common person all the way to the to the king himself. And, and so we begin here in, in this, the first verse of this 39th chapter of the book of Jeremiah. And it says, and in the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the 10th month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and besieged it. It was a, a frightening thing when an army would come and besiege your city when your own army was not able to fend them off but had to retreat within the city walls itself and suddenly now you are choked off and there is the army all around your exterior gates. You're safe within the walls of your city but it is like wrestling when you put somebody into a, a choke hold and start to now take and choke the oxygen from them and if they cannot get oxygen then very quickly the wrestling is going to be over the the siege army put the city into a choke hold and now it was the clock started to run because it was a matter of food and water inside of the city. They were protected from the army but their enemy now was starvation. And so the, the, the army would just wait. And the suffering that would go on inside of the walls of any city that was laid siege until finally you tapped out. You, you either were dying of starvation or you weren't able to defend any longer the, the walls because of the, the lack of strength and so the army would come in. The Babylonians march up and they surround the holy city of Israel. Everybody runs in and there is the, the temple and, and there are gods and people but here is the enemy that has laid siege into the holy city itself and it says and in the 11th year of Zedekiah in the fourth month on the ninth day of the month the city was penetrated. We see the, the, just the simple facts are given here but it does not begin to describe the horror of what led up to that penetration that took place. It was the, the fall uh, of Jerusalem occurred in uh, July of 587 BC. It was after 18 months of a siege. Can you imagine an, an 18 month siege over a year and a half now when, when there was this uh, enemy that came that changed every single person's life. It made me to think how we could relate because there was an enemy that came against our nation and against the whole world about 18 months ago called COVID. And, and this enemy now changed the way that we went outside. It changed our freedoms. It changed the way that we interacted with one another, the way that we gathered together as groups. And, and so it was this, this, this enemy that affected this invisible enemy that, that in 
infected uh, now and affected in our life. For a year and a half, they were within those uh, walls, not able to leave and to depart. And, and so we see that, that this takes place uh, now uh, during Zedekiah, the end of Zedekiah's reign here. He has been sitting on the throne uh, for about 11 years. He rises into uh, his position when he's about 20 years old. He's about 31 years old now. Zedekiah the king is uh, at this time. And it says, all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate. Nergal, Sherezer, Samgar, Nebo, Sars, Shechem, Rabsaris, Nagal, Sarezeres, Rabmag, with the rest of the princes of the king of Babylon. And I don't think anybody's ever butchered names worse uh, there than, than I did. But those were the, the, the names of the princes there of, of Babylon. But uh, verse 4, it says, and so it was when Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and all the men of war saw them that they fled and went out of the city by night, by the way of the king's garden, by the gate between the two walls, and he went out by the way of the, the plain. So the king Zedekiah up in his tower saw the, the breach, the penetration now, and, and the princes and the nobles come into the center gate, and, and there they encamp. And, and so demonstrating their authority now over the city, and, and so Zedekiah has a secret passage away between the walls, between the gates, out of his royal palace which is inside of the walls and so he and his wife and his and children and and those and and so they they sneak out of the out of the, the the palace and out of the city that night and they try and make a break for it and uh, and so they head up uh, out and then they go over the the walls uh, and through the gates and, and then over the Mount of Olives and, and then they head out towards the Jordan River. Uh, but the Chaldean army pursued them and, and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had captured him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar's uh, king of Babylon to Riblah in the land of Hamath where he pronounced judgment on him. And then the king of Babylon killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes in Riblah. And the king of Babylon also killed all the nobles of Judah. And moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with bronze and fetters to carry him off to Babylon. We see roughly 15 miles, the royal family escapes, and they get about 15 miles there towards Jericho and the Chaldean army overtakes them and, and then brings them to where Nebuchadnezzar's command is. His headquarters is in Ribla, it tells us, in Hamath. That's about 230 miles away. And so they uh, march them now to present them be, before King Nebuchadnezzar. And, and so we see here that uh, the king now executes his family in front of his eyes. Can you imagine being held captive and watching your own kids being executed? He's, he's 31 years old, so his kids are, are, are relatively young, and his own eyes has to watch that. And then after Nebuchadnezzar has him watch the execution of his children. He puts Zedekiah's eyes out so that that will be the last thing that he ever sees is his entire life is the slaying of his own children. And then he brings him now and puts him into bronze fetters and is going to uh, march him to Babylon. Zedekiah is going to live a, a long time. He's going to have a, a long time to ponder those things. The princes of Judah are also executed. And you'll remember that throughout all of this, Jeremiah was telling Zedekiah, surrender to the Babylonians and you will live and the people will live 
and the judgment will not come upon you. And he would not obey God. He would not obey the voice of God. And he tried to protect himself and he tried to protect his family instead of trusting God. God will protect you and God will protect your family. And God will keep you safe if you will entrust yourself into the care of the Lord. And he could not find the faith to trust God. And we see the horrible consequences now that he brings upon his own head by not trusting God. The regret now that he will live with the, the rest of his life. We, we see the, the very shame that he suffers uh, he suffers because he, he, he ignored the, the warnings of the Lord. And so verse 8, And the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the houses of the people with fire and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. And then Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive to Babylon the remnant of the people who remained in the city and those who defected to him with the rest of the people who remained. Now, remember, the, the Babylonians said, if you will come out of the city, the, the offer was to everybody in the city, if you will come out, your lives will be spared, and we will bring you back to Babylon. So there were people that had defected uh, out, and then after they came in and, and smashed through the walls and destroyed, then uh, they took some captive back uh, with them as well. And so we see it says in verse 10, but Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left in the land of Judah the poor people who had nothing and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. So we see that they now destroy the walls of Jerusalem here as well. The city is left defenseless. It is left vacant. And to the very poorest, they gave them now the fields. They took the landowners and uh, brought them back as captives and, and established uh, now the, uh, those that were impoverished uh, gave them the fields and the vineyards. And, and no doubt there would be a, a tribute or a tax upon their property that uh, that now would go to Nebuchadnezzar but we see here that uh, that now only the very poorest uh, of the people were left behind now Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon verse 11 gave charge concerning Jeremiah to Nebuzaradan the captain of the guard saying take him and look after him and do him no harm but do to him just as he says unto you. So no doubt Nebuchadnezzar had heard of Jeremiah, had heard of the prophet that was declaring that the, 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 the city of Jerusalem should capitulate to uh, Nebuchadnezzar and uh, possibly through the testimony of those that had defected uh, out, uh, possibly also from the uh, earlier letters uh, that uh, the prophet had sent to Babylon. We saw those back in chapter 29. But in any event, we see that Nebuchadnezzar, aware of Jeremiah, gives instruction to the captain of the guard that when you do break through the walls, make sure that no harm comes to Jeremiah. And we see again how God protects uh, his own. God protects his, his remnant uh, here. And, uh, and so um, Jeremiah now is going to be spared. And and so, verse 13, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, sent Nebuchadnezzar, Rabsaris, Nergal, Sherazir, Rabmag, and all the king of Babylon's chief officers. And then they sent someone to take Jeremiah from the court of the prison and committed him to get Eliah, the son of Hyakam, the son of Shaphan, that he should take him home. And so he dwelt among the people. Now, Gedaliah here is going to be appointed as the governor over what is left after the, the Babylonians and depart and, uh, and of those who remained now in the land. And so the instructions uh, now they can, are to commit Jeremiah to Gedaliah in verse 15. And meanwhile, the word of the Lord had come to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison 
saying, go and speak to Ebed-Melech, the Ethiopian, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will bring my words upon this city for adversity and not for good, and they shall be performed in that day before you. He sends the, the, the message that the Babylonians are going to come and destroy the city. Now, you remember that this is the Ethiopian that had come and hoisted him out of the, uh, out of the well that he had been placed into. And so the word of the Lord comes to him that he is to send this message uh, here to Ebed. He says, but verse 17, but I will deliver you in that day, says the Lord. And you shall not be given into the hand of the men of whom you are afraid. And so here we see the Lord is ministering to the, to the fear of Ebed. And the Lord comes and says, you, you have nothing to be afraid of. He tells Jeremiah to go and to give this message to him that you shall not be given into the hands of the Babylonian. No harm is going to come to you. And we see here that that God is ministering now to, to the anxiety that was in Ebed. We see over and over and over the word of the Lord telling us to be anxious for nothing, to not to be afraid, and how God ministers to our fear. Fear is such a prison. Fear puts people into such a prison, and God wants that, that prison broken and free. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow, what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink. He says, you know, sufficient for today are the, are the things of the day. My father, he, he watches over the very sparrows. Are you not of more importance than, than him? Don't fear don't be afraid. Put your trust in the Lord and, and then live your life. Live it freely and fully and live it to the glory of God and, and walk in that freedom without the, the oppression and the condemnation that the enemy so loves to see us who have been set free voluntarily bowed down, listening to the voice of his condemnation, listening to his whispers about disaster that, that will come and uncertainty of tomorrow. There is so much fertile ground in the uncertainty of the future. Amen. Nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow. And, and so the, the enemy can say, what if disaster happens tomorrow? And we go, oh, I never even thought about that. Tomorrow could be a terrible day. Oh, I never thought about that. And, and suddenly now the, the, these whispers and, and, and suddenly we, we take, ruminate those. And, and what does the Bible say? The Bible tells us now take every thought captive. Here's the other voice, right? Here's the voice of God. Tomorrow could be the best day of your life. <laughs> Tomorrow God's got blessings laid all over the place for you to stand up and to go and to discover them today. And this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it and be what? And, and be glad, not, not hunched down in, in fear, in oppression, trapped to now within our own heads by the imaginations and the ruminations uh, that are around us. And, and so there are obstacles, there are real difficulties that, that we do experience and we do face uh, in our lives, but yet we can look um, to the Lord to be our strength in those adversities and we can trust him knowing that he will prevail and he will draw us through them, and we don't need to be afraid. Even the battles that we go into, we can't control the battles that we are going to have in our lives. But this is what I do know, that the battle belongs to the Lord. And so if the battle belongs to the Lord, then we can put our trust in the battle, and we can continue living our life even in the midst of the uncertainty and the difficulties. Here we have this Ethiopian eunuch who showed great courage. This is a courageous man. But now his courage is beginning to, to waver. He was courageous enough to, 
to defy the princes who had thrown Jeremiah down into the well. The very thing that the king was afraid of, the power of these princes and what they could do to them. We see here that, that this servant, he, he, he takes his own life in his hands. He goes you know, to the king and, and spares the life of Jeremiah. But, but now his faith is, is beginning to falter. And we see that God sees the, the condition of his heart. He sees the fear that he is becoming susceptible to. And what does God do? He goes and ministers to that fear so, so that he can be set free of that and fear. And, and I believe that God does the same thing with us. I believe that when we start to fall into fear, it's, it's amazing how so much of the Christian music we sing is about not being afraid and, and trusting in the Lord. The, the verses that we read, the, the, the encouragements of friends and, and the exhortations that, that we receive, that, that the Lord is seeking to deliver you out of fear. Are you afraid? Our nation is experiencing another wave of COVID where we are seeing the, the, the difficulties and the hardships and, and all. And, and there is a landscape now of great uncertainty in, in our land. And, and here's what I want you to know. We will go through this. We will come out the other side. And the question is this. Did we do it trusting the Lord or did we do it wrenching our hands in anxiety and anxiety? and being nervous over every second. You see, fear steals the quality of the life that you have. When you're living in fear, you're not living, you're existing, and God doesn't want us to exist, he wants us to, to live. He wants us to trust him and to put our faith in him and then to be busy about the Lord's work, which is loving God and loving others. And, and so here we see that, that God wants us ministered to, he wants us to be free from fear, free from anxiety. He wants us to be trusting in him and God is gonna minister to us and help us. You have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit inside of you helping you to be encouraged and to not yield and to surrender to fear and anxiety in your life. Here we see that Eba didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but God is capable of ministering to every single person, amen? And so here we see that he does it through the prophet Jeremiah and sends him this message. You don't need to be afraid. No harm is going to come to you. God is protecting him. And thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring my words upon this city, not for good, and they shall be performed in that day before you, but I will, verse 17, deliver you in that day, says the Lord. And you shall not be given into the hand of the men whom you are afraid, for I will surely deliver you. And you shall not fall by the sword, but your life shall be as a prize to you, because you have put your trust in me, says the Lord. And so we see the reward of his faith is the deliverance uh, now from the fear and ultimately he also is going to be delivered from the Babylonians uh, as well. He put his trust in the Lord. And in that he sets a great example for you and me today to put our trust in the Lord regardless of what circumstances you find yourself in personally today. He is besieged by the Babylonian army and crumpling defenses here. Those were trying circumstances, but he put his trust in the Lord and the Lord delivered him. Chapter 40, it says the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after Nebuzaradan the captain of the guard had let him go from Ramah when he had taken him bound in chains among all who were carried away captive from Jerusalem and Judah who were carried away captive to Babylon. So we see Ramah is a few miles north of Jerusalem. And so what they did is they used it as a, as a staging area. And so they brought everybody out of the city to an area now where they could see the people more clearly and they could 
divide them up. And though Nebuchadnezzar had told them that they were not to do any harm to Jeremiah, they just rounded the people up and Jeremiah got caught up in the rounding up and he, he finds himself herded there to uh, Rama. And so it says, and the captain of the guard took Jeremiah and said to him, the Lord your God has pronounced this doom on this place. Now the Lord has brought it and has done just as he said, because you people have sinned against the Lord and not obeyed his voice. And therefore, this thing has come upon you. And interesting that um, here we see that, uh, that, that, that this captain of the guard recognizes that the consequences that the nation had experienced was because of their disobedience to God. And so it is always a, a, a sad day when, when the world stands up and rebukes believers uh, here for their conduct. But this is exactly what we see happening uh, here. He says in verse 4, And now look, I free you this day from the chains that were on your hand. If it seems good to you to come with me to Babylon, come, and I will look after you. But if it seems wrong for you to come with me to Babylon, remain here. See, all the land is before you. Wherever it seems good and convenient for you to go, go there. So Jeremiah is given the choice. Now you'll remember that Nebuchadnezzar had issued that command that whatever he wants to allow that, permit that to him. And so the choice is given. You can stay here. The the city has been burned and destroyed and there is a remnant of people that is left behind or you can come with the captives to Babylon and you'll be taken care of there. And so we see that the choice now is given to the prophet and it says, now while Jeremiah had not yet gone back, Nebuzaradan said, go back to Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon has made governor over the cities of Judah and dwell with him among the people or go wherever it seems convenient for you to go. And so the captain of the guard gave him rations and a gift and let him go. And then Jeremiah went to Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakim, to Mizpah and dwelt with him among the people who were left in the land. Mizpah is sort of the middle of the nation of uh, Israel and it was where they first set up the tabernacle when they came in and it was kind of the first capital of the nation before it was uh, moved uh, to Jerusalem and so it's about three miles away from uh, Rama and uh, and now we see that there is a kindness provisions are given to Jeremiah and a gift and it says in verse seven, and when all the captains of the armies who were in the fields, they and their men heard that the king of Babylon had made Gedaliah the son of Ahiakam governor in the land and had committed to him men, women, children in the poorest of the land who had not been carried away and captive to Babylon. So we see here that Gedaliah is, uh, a man of, of birth, he is the grandson of King Josiah, uh, or uh, of one of Josiah's nobles, and, and so they set him up as their governor, as a puppet governor now, uh, and he is given the, the supervision over the, the desolate area, now the province of Judah. Gedaliah is a good ruler, no doubt Jeremiah now will support him and uh, he ends up uh, ruling for about five years and, and then ultimately he was uh, assassinated uh, in the end. In verse eight it says, then they came to Gedaliah at Mizpah, Ishmael the son of Nethaniah, Johanan and Jonathan the sons of Korea, Sarah the son of Tanhumeth, the sons of Ephi, the uh, Netophathite, and Jazaniah, the son of Amakahiathite, they and their men, and Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan, took an oath before them and their men, saying, Do not be afraid to serve the Chaldeans, 
dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. And as for me, I will indeed dwell at Mitzpah and serve the Chaldeans who come to us. But you, gather wine and summer fruit and oil and put them in your vessels and dwell in your cities that you have taken. And so here we see this uh, this edict that is being given, those that are left behind and inhabit the land and gather the, the fruits and the oils and the vessels. And in verse 11, likewise, when all the Jews who were in Moab among the Ammonites in Edom and who were all in all the countries heard that the uh, king of Babylon had left a remnant of Judah and that he had set over them Gedaliah the son of Ahiakim the son of Shaphan. Then all the Jews returned out of the places where they had been driven and came to the land of Judah to Gedaliah at Mizpah and gathered wine and summer fruit in abundance. And so we see that Jerusalem is destroyed now in the uh, middle of the summer. There was still time to take in the, the crops now as the Babylonians and depart. And, uh, and so they were successful in harvesting now the, the, those that had fleed from Israel when the Babylonians came that were outside of the city when they heard that Gedaliah now was established as the governor then they all began to uh, return the the few the remnants that were out there and and they came back and they helped with the the harvest uh, that was there in verse 13 moreover Johanan the son of Korea and all the captains of the forces that were in the fields and came to Gedaliah at Mizpah and said to him, do you certainly know that Baalus, the king of the Amorites, has sent to Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, to murder you? But Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakim, did not believe him. Now, Judah and uh, Ammon were allies when uh, Jerusalem fell. And, uh, and so we see in spite of their union as uh, allies, Judah and Ammon were, were still countries that didn't trust uh, one another. And, and so they had a common enemy and they joined the, in an alliance against a common enemy. But they still had their own uh, issues. And uh, we see that Ammon rejoices uh, over Jerusalem's fall. Uh, and so they knew that if Nebuchadnezzar's army was committed in the siege against Jerusalem, that the army uh, wasn't free to come and attack them. And, uh, and so we see that, uh, that this was a, a reason apart uh, now for their uh, rejoicing over the fall. But we see here that there is this plot uh, to uh, kill Gedaliah. And we see here that, that Gedaliah doesn't believe the, the plot uh, here. And in verse 15, it says, Then Johanan, the son of uh, Korea, spoke secretly to Gedaliah in Mitzpah saying, let me go, please, and I will kill Ishmael, the son of uh, Nathaniah, and no one will know it. Why should he murder you so that all the Jews who are gathered to you would be scattered and the remnant in, in Judah perish? And, and so and here we see that he comes uh, now, in Korea comes and, and asks uh, permission to go and to kill the one that is supposed to uh, assassinate uh, Gedaliah. But we see in verse 16 that Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakim, said to Johanan, the son of Korea, you shall not do this thing for you speak falsely concerning mm, Ishmael. And mm, so mm, here we see that uh, that Gedaliah doesn't show wisdom. The Bible tells us to be wise as serpents and innocent as and doves. And we see that there is information that comes to him, but, but he says, no, that, that information can't be true. That, 
that, that, that can't be true. And, and so we see here that, uh, that there was uh, action that was needed to um, avert uh, this, but that action uh, is not taken. And, uh, and there again, we see that, that we are called not only to walk by faith, but also to use the wisdom that God gives to us at, at, at the same time. The Bible tells us that there's wisdom in the multitude of counselors and, and that we are to, to walk according to the sense that God gives us, the knowledge and the information, and to govern ourselves wisely, judiciously here. We see that there was a credible threat against him, and, and we see that he just dismisses it, and, and he takes no actions whatsoever. And, and, and there are people that God warns. He warns them. He warns them. He warns them. And, and, and they're just like, well, I'm just going to trust God. And, and it's like, but trusting God, he's warning you. If there's a hurricane, you need to put boards over your windows. There's a hurricane coming. And, and they're like, well, you know what? I'll just trust the Lord for my windows. And it's like, the Lord's telling you there's a hurricane coming. He, he is protecting your windows by having you put boards uh, over your windows. And it's like, well, you know what? I'm just trusting the Lord. You know, he'll just, you know, protect me. And, and so there is that element of faith, but there's an element of faith that stirs us into action. And so God will give us that word of knowledge. He will give us that assistance. But we, we can't become super spiritual and ignore the practical uh, of what God is in delivering into our hands and, and now saying that I'm just going to rise above it. I'm going to do nothing and just show how spiritual I am by trusting him and doing nothing. And, and, and that is not exemplary faith. Exemplary faith is, is when you take and listen to what the, the Lord is saying and now you act upon what the Lord is and saying in your life. And, and so the, the balance in between faith and action and the leading of the Lord in, in our lives. We see ultimately here in these in chapters the, the incredible sad destruction, the fall of Jerusalem. I think of Jeremiah's life and uh, and, and how he saw the, the deterioration of his nation. He saw the, the, the warnings of God who was used mightily to speak against the, the leaven, the corruption, the direction that the nation was heading. He was sounding the, the warning in, in his life. And ultimately his desire was that, that this day would never come, that, that he would never live to see it. Jeremiah is one of the prophets in the Bible who actually sees his own prophecies come to pass. He lives, uh, outlives his prophecies and sees the very fulfillments of his prophecies. He sees the, the fall of Jerusalem, which he had been prophesying. And you remember that he was declaring that God was going to bring judgment against them. But the people didn't believe it. Do you know why? They had the temple. They had the temple right there. This incredible edifice, this incredible place that, that was the representation of the presence of God. And, and even though they weren't honoring God any longer, they felt that, that God would never let his holy city ever be destroyed. This, this is Jerusalem doggone it and there well, nothing's going to happen to to this city here and, and and so you know jeremiah sees the the uh, the apathy of the people in their in their relationship with god they have the ex external trappings of it they have the history of the faith but his generation there was no faith they were not living out their relationship with God. Though the nation had been birthed and born in faith, we see now there was just the aftermath, just, just the fumes uh, of it. Uh, and, and so Jeremiah, he, he, 
ministers to the, the, the nation as it is in decline, the very prophecies that he, he delivers to the people, we see that he sees them come to pass in his own life. And, and yet through it all, what do we see? We see the faithfulness of Jeremiah. We see the faithfulness of Jeremiah to continue to live obedient to God and then in the end, what do we see? We see God's hand of protection upon him. God always protects, listen to this, his remnant. Even though judgment comes upon the nation, God always keeps his hand upon the remnant. And, and so we are able to trust in the Lord even when the nation is heading in the wrong direction, we can pray for the nation and know that God's hand regardless is going to be upon us in our lives and we can put our trust in the Lord and the Lord will always take care of his own. Amen? Amen. And so trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't live in fear Put your hope in heaven. Know that today we are one day closer to, uh, to heaven than we were yesterday. And that's uh, always good news. And, and we look forward to the return of Jesus Christ, who's going to straighten out all of this. Uh, and we will live underneath uh, his glorious reign. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for hope. Thank you for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Thank you for leading us and guiding us and into truth. And so, God, we ask that you would continue. Show yourself mighty in our lives, in our homes. And God, we pray for our nation. Pray for our leaders. And Lord, we pray for safety from disease and sickness. We, we ask comfort on all those that are suffering, and God, even this day. We ask, God, that you would bless and strengthen marriages and families, and God, that, that you would help us to love you more fervently, more passionately today than ever before. And God, that, that the manifestation of, of our intimate love for you is reflected in, in the way in which we love and serve one another. And so, God, help us to have feet to our faith, Help us to not just trust you, but also to listen and obey and to live free, free from fear, free from anxiety. Lord, with a fullness of trust and hope in you. So God, thank you for today. And thank you for loving us. Thank you for being our high tower, our safe harbor, our refuge, our God and our King. We love you and thank you. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen.